Eat meat, drink water is a mantra that's worked very well for many people on the zero carb carnivore diet. Maybe they only ate beef water with no salt for a couple weeks. Other people interpret it as, uh, let me go to McDonald's, get a couple bacon cheeseburgers, take the bun off, and then they wonder why they don't have success on the carnivore diet. I'm going to explain to you guys how to get started on the carnivore diet and where people tend to go wrong from fat to protein ratio, how most people consume too much protein, how that ties into nutrients and satiation, digestion and how that's affected by cooking temperature, food additives and allergies, as well as salt and electrolytes and how consuming too much food can cause you to get thirsty and deplete your electrolytes. So first we have to start with the book The Fat of the Land. It's about an Arctic explorer named Viammar Stephenson. He went around and pretty much understood that Eskimos obtained 80% of their calories from fat as well as 20% of their calories from protein. And they had many, many preferences for fatty parts of the animal because grain-fed ribeyes and ground beef did not exist, unfortunately, for some of you guys. So, and, and then this gets ridiculous. Like, literally, I have 40 quotes from that book. I'm going to link you guys in my Twitter description explaining, like, oh, they like the fish head over the caribou fat, over the skin of the warthog. Many, many indigenous food preferences leaning towards fat and organ meats. I've heard Sean Baker take a quote out of context in that book saying they fed the liver of caribou to the dogs because caribou don't have a gallbladder and the liver is bitter from the bile. There's literally 40 other quotes in that book explaining preference. There's like five quotes just saying preference for liver, let alone the other 30 to 40 quotes for organs. And he is literally taking one quote out of context to justify that we don't have to consume organ meat. That also ties into the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio because the meat that these Eskimos ate was natural and wild. And it was inherently very, very high in vitamins. And these carnivore dieters say, I feel better eating beef than pork or chicken. Well, the reason you feel better eating beef than pork or chicken is because beef is closer to wild meat in regards to its omega ratio and nutrient content. But you know what else is closer to wild meat in its omega-3 ratio and nutrient content? I'll give you a second to guess. Grass-fed beef. So when I say, why don't you take an extra step and try grass-fed beef and see if you feel better, they don't really care. A lot of uh, contradictory stuff going on in these zero-carb veterans, but that's enough salt for now. I'll post that Twitter argument in the description for you guys to check it out. It's a little silly. So we've established 80% fat, 20% protein. Needs to be a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. But where does this tie in directly? Omega-3 foods do have more nutrients and they can help us meet our RDAs and satiate ourselves through the order of satiety, which I will explain in a minute. But one of the most important things is high omega-6 fats don't digest well, whether they're raw or cooked, and they tend to taste off and funky. So having a high omega-6 fat as your primary source of calories will only be inflammatory. In regards to cooking temperature, even if it is a good omega-3 source, beef, tallow, even grass-fed might have been rendered too much and it might not digest well. Same with pasteurized butter. And I'm not going to name any names here, but if you have diarrhea for six weeks, then change the food source, change the cooking temperature. It's the food. It's not your stomach. So just by following an 80% fat to 20% protein diet with high quality animal foods, we kind of achieve all of these things. But I guess we have to go a little further in depth. Frank, what difference does this actually make? Well, Sean Baker might be eating four to six pounds of ribeye steak per day whereas the Inuit Eskimos would only eat a third of a pound of fat and two pounds of steak. Not only does that reduce digestive stress greatly, fat has way more nutrients. Well, not way more, but fat is where the nutrients are stored. So you're inherently, you're reducing digestive stress, you're optimizing macronutrient ratios, as well as increasing nutrient density. And we know that grain-fed ribeye and, you know, ground beef did not exist, but, you know, we can still use grass-fed versions of those things to kind of achieve our 80% fat ratio. Uh, the cooking temp doesn't really seem to be something that most people have to alter, although I will say you have to buy fresh, high quality fat. You have to cook it to whatever temperature you like. Uh, the problem I've seen with cooking temperature is people buying like smoked foods, pre-cooked foods, pasteurized foods. That's where the problem comes with cooking temperature. But in general, cooked meat does not digest as well as raw meat or lighter cooked meat because the B vitamins are denatured, the fat soluble vitamin content is slightly lower, uh, there's a much lower moisture content, it makes you thirsty. I tried Sean Baker's grain-fed steak diet for like two days, I couldn't do it. 
I was just so hungry. I could not satiate my appetite. I was eating like five or six pounds of grain fed steak per day. I was so thirsty with the high food volume. I was depleting my body of electrolytes with so much water. Food additives kind of tie in with allergies in a sense that we need to remove inflammatory foods initially on this diet, uh, especially dairy and eggs. Unfortunately, those are the only good sources of fat a lot of people initially have access to, as well as things like soy lecithin and cheese. And the point is to remove them and see what happens when you reintroduce them. Uh, and I have videos on dairy and eggs coming up over the next two days. Uh, in regards to the additives, it's kind of a diff people just need to really be strict with the diet for the first few weeks to see how things go. The order of satiety explains a lot of things. And once you experience it, you'll kind of understand where I'm coming from. So if you eat only fat first and pure fat, you will get nauseous. It only takes about a, a half of a pound to a third of a pound of fat for someone to get full on fat. Very interesting. Eat pure fat. And then for nutrients, nutrients also have that same super high satiation. If you eat salmon roe, I guarantee you, you won't be able to eat more than like a quarter pound of salmon roe once. It's so high in nutrients, it just satiates your hunger. That's why I tell people, if you eat half a pound of grass-fed fat and then a quarter pound of liver... I can't understand why you would be hungry for a steak. I mean, you might want a little bit, but for the most part, fat and high nutrient foods will satiate your hunger. And this could be as easy as having eggs with a lot of butter in them, like high quality pastured eggs and raw butter, or having some grass fed marrow fat with some oysters. You can achieve your fat and your nutrient density. And that is what the main difference is between what Sean Baker does and what the Inuit Eskimos do. They achieved a very high fat intake, a very high nutrient intake through high quality animal foods, as well as just in general, better omega-3 ratios. What you're getting by buying high quality animal foods or just even incorporating, all you got to do guys, have a few pastured egg yolks here and there, have some oysters once a week. You're getting all the fat soluble vitamins. On a grain fed steak diet, all you're getting is vitamin B and some minerals for the most part, very small amounts of other vitamins. And... What drives me crazy is people will go on the carnivore diet forums and say, oh, I'm having a hard time. And people say, eat more meat. One pound of salmon roe probably has more nutrients than you've eaten in a month of your grain-fed ribeye steaks. It's literally mind-boggling to the advice I see some of these people getting. And I know I, I might have come across as a bit abrasive in this video, but... And unfortunately, most of this video is just me speaking negatively about what other people do on the carnivore diet, but that's unfortunately what this video had to be uh, because of all the advice I've been seeing. Uh, sun, water, and exercise. People will go so far against the grain in regards to their carnivore diet, but they don't care about their D3 levels. They don't care that they're drinking pesticides in their water. They don't care that they're not getting exercise and increasing their lean body mass, improving their posture. There's so many other elements to health that, you know, the reason I'm able to come up with these ideas and these theories is through my objectiveness, my open-mindedness, my willingness to self-experiment and see what other people are doing. And most importantly, admit I'm wrong and I always have more to learn. Uh, so I think I've kind of gone over all the points. Uh, just to briefly touch on everything, uh, fat to protein ratio, you need to consume more fat, high quality fat. This is the biggest hurdle, getting a high quality source of fat. Go to your local butchers. I go to my local supermarket. They give me lamb trim fat for free. I'll show you guys that in a few minutes. Uh, I went to my local Asian market today. They said, oh, we'll collect some fish roe for you for the week. Uh, nutrients, how they tie to satiation. Try that, guys. Eat some fat. Get some oysters. See how much less of it you eat than grain-fed ribeye. Digestion, how the high omega-6 fats and lighter cooked fats digest way easier. If you're having diarrhea or anything, definitely try that. Food additives, soy lecithin, sugar, nitrates, soy that might be in certain foods. Can be an issue for some people. Cooking temperature. Lighter cooked food always digests better. Salt and electrolytes. Most people find that they do reduce the salt on their food over the course of this diet, but the main concern is consuming too much cooked meat and depleting your electrolytes with a high water intake. Allergies. Definitely remove dairy and eggs initially. Reintroduce them three to four weeks in. You'd be surprised at how many low-level inflammatory reactions go under the radar. So I'm going to go down to my fridge and show you guys just the fat that I eat. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. All right, so in here I have slabs of lamb fat, and this is basically the bulk of my calories. Uh, my local supermarket gives these to me for free sometimes even, 
and I literally get 80% of my calories from this lamb fat. All I do is I toss that on the grill and then I'll have it with, you know, whatever meat is on sale, whatever I get. Uh, but I usually don't pay more than six or seven dollars a pound for meat and I get the fat for almost free. So I'm eating for a fairly cheap price every day and very, very high quality stuff. The hardest part of this is sourcing fat. And you go to your local supermarkets, go to your local butchers, ask them if they trim animals, go online, get a good high quality source of fat. You know, if you can tolerate raw butter, if you can tolerate pastured eggs, that's great. But initially, if you can find a source and remove all the other things from your diet initially for a few weeks, and then reintroduce the dairy and eggs back in to see how you react. If you guys want specifics on things, I have many videos over the past two weeks approximately, and some videos that will be coming out like tomorrow and Wednesday on dairy and eggs that will explain things further. Uh, if you guys would like to support me, check out my Amazon shop. I have a lot of products I use. Uh, check out my Patreon to see my personal story, what I've been doing lately in my life. Uh, if you guys want to reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one consultations and you would like me to apply all of the principles that I've learned in a simple and easy way and pretty much just tell you what to do, uh, shoot me an email, franka2fano at gmail.com.